Our gospel text and preaching text this morning is Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. The word of God for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Many of our sermons are focused on individual needs and individual relationships with God and individual interpretations of the scriptures to our personal lives. But every once in a while, as I indicated in the October uh, Grace Notes column that I write each month, I indicated that um, for a little while we're going to depart from the lectionary and also I'm going to depart from these kinds of individual focused sermons and instead talk about congregational life and health and how we as a congregation can kind of restock ourselves after the losses that we've received this past summer from folks moving out of the community and uh, be sure that the momentum that those folks helped us build over the past several years is not lost or weakened but is continued and even strengthened as we move ahead. So from time to time there are issues of congregational health and well-being that deserve to be addressed and 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 need to be heard by all of us in the same setting. So for I don't know how long, but for a while, that's going to be the focus of my messages to you. This morning, I want to focus on the power of an invitation. The power of an invitation. Because Jesus began his public ministry by inviting, as it turned out, 12 men to become his followers, his disciples. And if they had not responded to that invitation, we probably wouldn't be sitting here this morning. So there's great power in an invitation, especially in an invitation from Jesus. Bonnie and I experienced the negativity of being disinvited from a party once. We actually had been invited before we were disinvited, and we went to the party. I had been asked to offer a prayer for this couple in my church who was celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, and we were happy to do so. But it wasn't long after the dinner plates were removed from the tables and the party began to move into a roast of this couple, particularly the husband, who is a popular doctor in the area. And one of their friends came over to our table and said, (laughs) not too subtly, you can leave now. (laughs) Because I think she was concerned that they were going to be sharing things about my member of the church that I would be shocked to hear and find out about. Um, She was operating, I'm sure, out of a stereotype of pastors who uh, some people think never brush our teeth or wake up in the morning or anything else. Um, but so we, we left. It was a Saturday night. I turned to a pumpkin at 10 o'clock on Saturday night anyway, so it wasn't a big deal. But we knew that we had been disinvited. There's not much positive power in not being invited somewhere, or even worse, being disinvited once you're there. Have you ever had a neighborhood party to which you were not invited? Or you served on a committee and the committee had a meeting to which you were not invited? Or you can think of any number of other occasions in life when some were invited and you were not. What does an invitation do for us? Well, for one thing, it is an affirmation of our value to the person who is doing the inviting. For another, it it is an effort to reach out and include us in a defined group. And we, mo- we, we love most of the invitations that we receive in life. Wedding invitations, invitations to baptisms, invitations to graduations, invitations to birthday parties, anniversary celebrations, invitations to church, all kinds of invitations we experience in a very positive, life-affirming way. I have an idea that when Matthew and Andrew and James and John heard Jesus' invitation to them to come follow me, They were affirmed that this new teacher on the horizon about whom they'd already heard some things had enough interest in them to want them to become a part of his team. And so they eagerly and quickly left their fishing nets behind. In James and uh, John's uh, case, they even left their father behind 
and began following Jesus and were joined later by eight others. An invitation like that has the power to redirect our lives. And that's why it's important for us as a congregation to remember how strategic it is for us to be an inviting congregation, an invitational church. And by that, I mean, and Margaret our DS referred to this briefly last week. She took the other side of the equation, which we'll get to next week in, or the next time I preach in two weeks. But she, she did refer to the importance of being an invitational church, a church with our arms wide open, ready, willing, eager to accept whoever comes through our doors. The point that Margaret made last week was that for most of the 20th century, at least the last half of it, that formula worked very well for the church to organize itself to be a receiving entity because people were coming through our doors particularly after the Second World War on into the 60s and 70s and uh, we didn't have to work very hard to get them to come it was kind of a natural non-invitation invitation they just showed up and any church that was worth its salt made the people welcome and they were able to grow that's not our case in our culture today. People don't just naturally come into the church anymore. Many don't even respond to an invitation any longer. But it's nevertheless important for us to continue to be a strongly open, welcoming, invitational kind of congregation. Several years ago, someone did a survey, and I used to be much more up on these things than I am today, but uh, 10, 15 years ago, the survey results showed that something like it was either 40 percent or 60 percent take your pick 40 or 60 percent of people asked said that they would come to church if someone invited them if someone invited them the implication being they don't, they don't come to church because nobody has invited them and two years ago when Margaret Gillikin our Methodist superintendent was here she asked you the question how often do we Methodists invite people to come to church I was the only one in the room that knew the answer. Does anybody remember what the answer to that question is? How often do Methodists invite people to come to church? That's raised close, probably never. 30 years. Once in 30 years. I don't know how they determined that. <laughs> but even if it's worth once in 15 years, it's still not, still not a good record. So we don't want to be that kind of Methodists or Episcopalians here at Grace Church. We want to be an actively, weekly, monthly, ongoing, invitational congregation where we are actively going out and reaching out to our social networks because every one of us has a slightly different social network than anybody else in the church. And in our social networks are folks who uh, are people, many of them are people of faith. They believe in God. They perhaps even have committed their lives to Jesus Christ at some point in time but they don't currently have an effective church relationship. Maybe they belong to another church in the community, but they haven't been there for years. Maybe they belonged elsewhere before they moved to Buena Vista, and they just have not gotten around to selecting a church home here in town. But I would guess there are folks in all of our social circles who would be responsive to an invitation from you to come and join us for worship or for one of our other activities here at Grace Church. So that's part of being an invitational congregation. But what do we invite them to? I remember in my second church, I had a woman tell me, uh, and she was a lifelong member of the church, a faithful member of the church, a former Evangelical United Brethren uh, member of that, congreg of that denomination before they united with the Methodists. And she said to me one day, and when we were talking about evangelism, because we were trying to get our evangelism committee up and running, and I think I may have even invited her to be on the committee, and her response was, I could never invite anybody to join the Methodist church. And yet, we were her church. That's not being very invitational. So what are we inviting people to be a part of? Well, there is an aspect of the invitation that can get around to inviting folks to unite with the institutional entity called the United Methodist Church and be part of, in our case, an ecumenical fellowship of Methodists and Episcopalians. That's the institutional side of things. That is the least important invitation that we can ever give to folks. The more important invitation is to invite them into our fellowship circles. 
Years ago, I read a, a book that was very formative for me by Lyle Schaller, one of our great church consultants in the United Methodist Church who just died a couple of months ago. And in his book, uh, Assimilating New Members was, was his title, Lyle talked about the ways that congregations successfully and effectively assimilate and integrate into their life new members, new people. And he said that there is that membership circle, which is a large circle, and it includes all the persons who have decided to make a commitment to that congregation. But making a membership commitment to a congregation is no guarantee that a person is going to feel welcomed or a part of the life of that congregation or uh, is a commitment that's going to keep them hanging around long term, especially if they don't feel connected to anybody else in the congregation. So he began to develop the thesis that the more important circles in the life of a congregation are our fellowship circles, our small groups, our choir, our Sunday school classes, our small group studies, our outreach groups, our service groups, and so forth. And that the most effective way of inviting and receiving and assimilating new people into the life of the congregation is through our network of small groups. And there are a number of categories of small groups that it's important for every congregation to have some of. And let me just tick them off for you. The first is, in, and perhaps the most obvious, are study groups. Again, that's our Sunday, school, our Sunday school classes, our Bible study groups, our book study groups, uh, groups that may follow a certain topic of study for a season of, of, of the year or whatever. Uh, in my last church, we, every once in a while, would do a congregation-wide study. And we selected a book and ordered copies enough for all the members of the congregation to have it and to read through it. Uh, the study groups took it up for a period of six to eight weeks or whatever it was. I and my associates would preach on those themes uh, for that period of time. And we learned together as an entire congregation. That practice continued after I left, and they took up a book that was written by a former corporate CEO who became the head of World Vision. And it, he, he, the book was about how his faith transformed his life and he entered God's call to begin giving back to the world out of the largesse that he had received from the world. It revolutionized his life. The reading of that book as a congregation revolutionized the lives of many of, of my former members there. And a number of mission teams have come out of that congregation-wide study uh, that have gone to Africa and Haiti and other places in the world to be in mission to folks who are in desperate need. So that's the power of that kind of study group and that kind of study experience. Uh, spiritual formation is another kind of group, and I know Catherine offers a spiritual formation group for those who are interested here at, uh, at Grace Church. But the, the power of a study group is that it, it creates a reasonably safe crucible in which our spiritual growth can occur over a long period of time, more naturally, but also very dynamically and very powerfully. Another kind of group that the church needs to offer to folks are service groups. Because frankly, there are folks who didn't like school that much, and to ask them to open a book and read it is to ask a whole lot from them. And these are well-educated folks. Uh, life has educated them in some marvelous ways. I'm not denigrating the fact that they're not book learning people. Uh, you can learn a lot of stuff uh, outside of books but they just don't relate to books necessarily. Frankly, I don't relate to books all that well. I read a lot in preparation for preaching to you because I, I want to preach good stuff to you out of the good book and others. But I'm not that avid a reader, and a lot of folks are like me, and they don't have the impetus to study like I do to be uh, able to stand up here in front of you on a Sunday morning and sound halfway intelligent. But they really get into hands-on service groups. You give us a job to do, we'll do it. Don't ask us to meet and plan it. Don't ask us to study about it. Just tell us what to do, and we'll get out there, and we'll get the job done. And we need those kind of folks in the life of the congregation as well. So service groups that serve the administrative and ministry needs of the congregation is sort of the inward focus of these kinds of service groups. And then we can also and need to have a mission outreach groups whose focus is serving service beyond the congregation. So service within and service without. Both of those kinds of groups are extremely important. And mission outreach groups are those kinds of groups that I referred to a moment ago that may take mission trips to other parts of the world or other parts of the, of the, of the United States to be in mission 
to other folks and share with them the hope and the help of the gospel uh, to people who generally are in obvious need. And then the, another kind of group that uh, I think is very important, and we've just begun a couple of these in the last year here at Grace, are what I call affinity groups. I didn't actually coin that term. I think that term also comes from Lyle Schaller. But an affinity group is a group of people who share and are drawn together by a common interest. Uh, earlier this year, uh, I asked Brenda Harper to help me organize our first ATV road trip for those who in the congregation who enjoy ATVing. And we had eight couples go to Moab. Uh, since then, that same group organized uh, for trips to Lake City and to Red Cliff and to Meeker. And they were trying to get another group off the ground for this fall back to Moab, but that one, people were just so busy. But uh, this past Friday, we had 10 machines, which have been close to 20 people, on the trail to Webster Pass, on my side of Kenosha Pass. And that's an affinity group, folks who have a common interest and enjoy getting together. And what affinity groups can do for our invitational spirit in the church is they're open to everybody. This new photography group that we're trying to get off the ground is open to everybody. It's an affinity group. And there's a lot of keen interest in this group. I'm going to be excited to see how it, how it develops. But when we get folks together around a common interest, not necessarily a spiritual interest, it creates safe places for some of those folks in our social circles that I was talking about who haven't darkened the door of a church for years for many different kinds of reasons. But maybe they're interested in photography. Maybe they like to go ATV riding, ATV riding but they, they don't know who to ride with. And so they turn up in one or more of our affinity groups. And that helps us build a bridge of relationship out to them. And in the context of that relationship, you know what they discover? Oftentimes they discover that Christians aren't so bad after all. That not all of us live up to the negative reputation that Christian faith has come to have, unfortunately, and undeservedly in many cases, in our country. And as the warmth of those relationships develop over time, some of those folks will get up some Sunday morning and feel like, you know, I'd like to see the other members of my photography group or my ATV group or whatever other affinity group we may start. And they may just walk in through the doors here on a Sunday morning, and that's kind of what we're aiming for. Not to rope them in or hook them with a fish hook by the lip and pull them in, but to create a welcoming, accepting, loving environment where their spiritual growth can begin to happen because of God's activity in their life. Uh, reading up on some of this stuff again to refresh my memory of some of the things that are important to remember about being an invitational church, I came across again the analogy of a gardener. A gardener tills the ground and plants the seed and fertilizes and pulls the weeds and waters it. But the gardener has absolutely no power to grow anything. The only power the gardener has is to create a welcoming and sustaining environment in which growth can occur. But growth is caused by God. It's the same in the plant world as it is in the spiritual world and in the church world. We can't grow anybody spiritually. Our, that's God's task. Our task is to create that loving, accepting, warm, human, real environment in which people feel safe exploring their spiritual needs and questions and where spiritual growth can happen naturally by the Lord's activity in their life with us surrounding them in support. So those are some of the kinds of groups that are important for us to have. It, each, each one of these kinds of groups acts as a side door through which we can invite people into the larger life of the congregation. Now, two weeks ago, I preached from that text in Matthew's Gospel where uh, Matthew answered Jesus' call to, uh, to be his disciple, and then Matthew invited Jesus to his home for what we think was probably a party. And who did Matthew invite to this party with Jesus? His fellow tax collectors, the seedy folks of the ancient culture of Israel. And Jesus was criticized by the good folks for spending time with the seedy folks. 
and that's when Jesus said, I've come to, not to save the, those who are, are healthy, but to help those who are sick. And the other aspect of that that I didn't have time to touch on two weeks ago was that the genius of Matthew inviting his friends to come meet Jesus was because Matthew knew once people get to see who Jesus is, he wins them over. He wins them over. Matthew was just the connecting link between his friends and Jesus. And that's the same function that we can fulfill in our congregational life today. We can't be Jesus, but we can reflect Jesus to our friends who are needing greater spiritual depth and meaning in their life. And if we can successfully and continuously create a growth sustaining and supporting environment here at Grace Church into which we are constantly inviting people to come. They get in this environment and spiritual growth will happen. Our task is to bring them here, to hold them here by our loving presence and our relationships with them and then keep them here long enough for God to begin to do His work in their life. I have seen this process repeat over and over again through 40 years of ministry. This is the way churches grow in healthy and in dynamic ways. And uh, this is why I, I really love the mission statement of the United Methodist denomination so much. And it is this. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Is that a job you think we'll ever get done doing? No, it's a lifelong job. Is it a job that sometimes is hard to measure? You bet it is. Is it a job that's easy, easy to do? No, it isn't. It's a job that requires our highest dedication as individual Christians and as a congregation. It demands that we keep our focus on the main thing. As that famous quotation goes, uh, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> so staying focused as a congregation on the main thing of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world is what will keep us focused and honed in on creating the kind of environment where spiritual growth and life transformation can really occur. Now how do we make disciples of Jesus Christ? Well, the same way he did is a simple answer. And to flesh that out, we just need to lift up the fact that, that Jesus invited people to come follow him and be his disciples. We extend his own invitation to others to come and join us in being his disciples. Jesus spent time with people, a lot of time with people, all kinds of people, even the kinds of people that, uh, that made him the object of criticism by the religious leaders of his day. In fact, they accused him of being a wine-bibber and a glutton because of the parties that he went to and the people that he associated with and the people that he listened to and talked with and shared the, the good news of the gospel with. Well, we're to do the same. To stretch out beyond our circles of comfort, our comfort zones, into uncomfortable relationships with uncomfortable or with people that make us feel uncomfortable and try to establish an ongoing building relationship with all kinds of folks who are in need of the Lord's grace in their life. Jesus spent a lot of time with people, and we need to do that too. And that's another part, uh, another important part of our small groups. It's a way that we can spend quality time with folks. And Jesus had a lot of spiritual conversations with people, and we can do that too. I think those of us in the mainline Protestant denominations like the Methodists and the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and others got really gun-shy about this whole subject of evangelism back in the 20th century. And it, a lot of groups practiced evangelism very, very badly. There was a lot to react against. But sometimes we threw the baby out with the bathwater. The bathwater needed to be changed, but for goodness sake, don't throw the baby out. Evangelism is that quintessential primary Christian activity of inviting people to come and become followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. So by spending time with folks, we kind of live that invitation into their hearts and lives. We have multiple opportunities to have spiritual conversations with them. 
And these spiritual conversations can range from something as uh, trivial as, uh, um, you know, if God is, is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? Or uh, that's not so trivial, really, but, you know, it's, it's one of those questions that even us preachers don't like to hear. And one worse than that is the one that our children often ask, well, who created God? <laughs> People wonder about those things, and they often bubble up in our spiritual conversations with them. Those are kind of broad, general, philosophical, theological questions for which, frankly, there are no satisfying answers. There are some answers not necessarily satisfying. But there are also test questions for us by some of these folks who are just kind of feeling us out to see, are we going to be reasonable in talking about our faith, or are we going to fulfill all of their worst fears of what a Christian person is like? And so we have to go through some test questions sometimes to establish our trustworthiness that persons can trust us with their real spiritual questions, which may include, why did my baby die? Why did my marriage break up? Why did my business fail? And I went from being uh, able to live a comfortable life financially to being next to a pauper. Why? Why? Lots of why questions that people have. But they won't trust those questions to the demagogues who just come back with scripture quotes and pat answers and all those kinds of things. This is why it's very important for us to develop our own faith experience and grow in our own faith maturity so that when we have opportunities for these kinds of in-depth spiritual conversations, we are able to share from a genuine reality point of view. The other way that Jesus uh, invited people to become his disciples was to model life in the kingdom of God. I won't go into that much farther than just to point that out as one of his strategies. It was more than a strategy. It was really who he was. The Gospel of Luke has been noted by some theologians as being a gospel that, that lifts the veil for us readers so that we can kind of peek under the tent, so to speak, and get a glimpse of what the kingdom of God Jesus came to preach and teach and live for us is all about. So that when we lift the the edge of the tent, the bottom of the tent, and and peek into the kingdom, we see a kingdom where everybody's healthy and whole, where nobody's lost morally or spiritually, where the kingdom of God is is exemplified by the, the will of God being done on earth as it is in heaven, and on and on. And Jesus has called us as his followers to continue living as a model of that kingdom in the midst of the kingdoms of this world that are literally falling apart around us day by day. Now in the typical congregation, according to Lyle Schaller, most new adult members fall into one of five categories within the first year of their joining the church. This is really important for us to hear and recognize. The first group are individuals who actually become a part of a small group of the kind that I've been talking about where membership in that face-to-face small group is meaningful and where they have a sense of belonging long before they sign the dotted line as a member of the congregation, of the institutional entity that is the congregation. So they belong and are accepted and feel belonged like they belong before they ever take that step towards membership. The second group are individuals who uh, become a part of that kind of group after they become institutional members, so to speak. The, uh, the third category of people are new members who are assimilated by accepting a role or office which gives them a sense of belonging and causes them to identify with that congregation. Um, this is both a, th- th- this is, this is a two-edged sword. A lot of congregations are so small and so desperate, smaller and more desperate than we are, that when a new person walks in the door, before they leave that morning, they've been put in charge of the nursery or... Uh, second grade Sunday school class or the kitchen or whatever. And that can be a real turn off to new people. But so can being here for six months or nine years and never being asked to do anything in the life of the church. And one of the examples that Lao Schaller lifts up in his book, Assimilating New Members, was of a woman who joined a congregation and she did all the things that she was, thought she, she thought she was expected to do, but she just never felt a part of anything 
until finally, a couple of years into her relationship with that congregation, somebody asked her to help in the kitchen. And then she felt accepted and needed. So that's the barrier. We need to be sure we get our newcomers across quickly, not too quickly, but quickly enough that they don't feel like they've been forgotten or ignored. And that's a job for all of us to do. Uh, after that, she felt like she really belonged in the life of that congregation. Um, the fourth category is those new members who accept a task or a job as a worker, perhaps rather than a leader. And then the remaining group of folks are those who are in the process of dropping into comparative inactivity because they have not found a place to belong and to feel valued and needed in the life of the congregation. So it's important to our congregational health to create an expanding number of opportunities for service in which we are continually inviting new people to become participants, meaningfully so, not just busy work, but putting them to work in the Lord's work and in the various areas of ministry that can make a difference in people's lives because that's what folks like to be part of a church for. The moral of this is that adult new members who do not become part of a group accept a leadership role or become involved in a task during their first year tend to become inactive members. They slip out the back door. Sometimes they're gone for months before we even notice that they're not here anymore, and that just adds insult to injury. The quality of group life is the most important single factor in the church's ability to assimilate new members. Now that statement comes again from Lau Schaller, but it is a statement that I found to be absolutely true across 40 years of ministry. Now sometimes when you're preparing for a sermon, you come across something that's so good, it doesn't have a lot of relevance to what you're, you're going to be preaching about, but you don't want to lose it. And I came across this paragraph in Schaller's book that I think is just really worth our noting this morning. He says, the most important influence on the health of a congregation is the leadership style of both the ministerial and lay leaders. This style can be, summon, can be summarized in these words, affirm and build, affirm and build. In broad general terms, it is very unlike the more common response in the life of many congregations, which can be described with these two words, criticize and divide, criticize and divide. Did you hear what the preacher said last Sunday? Well, what did you think about that? Aren't you angry about that? Or uh, a decision is taken by the church leaders and, and, and someone criticizes their, their decision or their leadership or whatever. It's to criticize and divide, criticize and divide, whereas healthy leadership says, um, says uh, affirm and build, affirm and build. And in this uh, approach to leadership, Schaller says that this, uh, this assumes that affirmation will be offered only when it can be done authentically. This approach assumes that affirmation is a far better foundation on which to build than, it, than is negative criticism. This requires minimizing the occasions when questions are raised in either-or language and optimizes the occasions when questions are stated in both-and terms. Now, Grace Church, from its infancy and in its... Uh, ecumenical fellowship phase has been a both and a firm and um, build kind of congregation. Because one of the first decisions that you had to face was, all right, getting together as Methodists and Episcopalians, are we going to worship in the Episcopalian way every Sunday or the Methodist way every Sunday? And there was enough wisdom in the body of leadership at that time to quickly decide, no, this is not an either or situation. This is a both and situation. We will both worship as Episcopalians part of the time and as Methodists the other part of the time. And you work that out and it has worked beautifully for nearly 15 years now. So the spirit of the leadership of the congregation is really, really key to our being an invitational church or congregation. And Grace is an invitational congregation. So please don't take this message as my trying to, uh, uh, to uh, address a deficit in our congregational life. Not that at all. My message this morning is intended to affirm one of our greatest strengths and to invite our renewed commitment to inviting people to follow Jesus in the growing atmosphere and environment that we work together to create. So we've talked about the ministry of hospitality. This morning we've talked about being an invitational congregation. Next time I'm here in two weeks I'll talk about the importance of our being a missional congregation. And that gets back to what Margaret was stressing last week, that we need to go, we need to be sent, we need to 
stretch our, our comfort zones and get out there in the world where we can build relationships to folks that don't have a meaningful relationship with God or Jesus Christ. Um, by focusing on creating and maintaining an environment that encourages and sustains the growth God wants the church to have, we will continue to be a healthy, vital, robust, growing congregation. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for the many ways you have blessed Grace Church. We ask that you continue to strengthen us, giving us a healthy and robust congregational life and reminding us constantly that you have blessed us to be a blessing to others. Teach us all of the ways we can share your blessings with others through being an invitational congregation. And we ask this in the name of the great inviter himself, Jesus Christ. Amen.